This is Joe with Joe'sAstrophoto.com. Welcome back to the channel and in today's video we are going to do something a little bit different. It's something that I like to call the full moon challenge. And I'm going to actually be taking two different images during the full moon cycle. So the full moon challenge is actually what I'm going to call trying to take an image, a narrow band image with a full moon out or during the full moon cycle. So two days before the moon is completely full and then the two days when one night when the moon's full and then the next night after. So th there's going to be a lot of artificial brightness out and I want to see instead of just not imaging at all, I want to see what the difference is uh, and, and how close I could get to the moon before I, re I decide that the image isn't worth it. So the first image I'd like to do uh, for the first couple nights, starting tonight, is going to be the Tulip Nebula. I want to get a nice tight close-up of the actual Tulip Nebula. And depending on how that goes, we're going to uh, go for a second night of data and then stack all of that together. And we're going to be using um, Astrodon filters, uh, five nanometers for HA, and three nanometers for sulfur and oxygen. We're also going to switch targets the night of the full moon. We're going to switch targets to the Wizard Nebula. And this is a little further away from the moon, and I wanna see if that makes a real big difference. Additionally, if this isn't complicated enough, I'm gonna use flats on the, the Tulip Nebula and I'm gonna try, I'm gonna take flats for the Wizard Nebula anyway, just in case I need them. But I wanna stack that image without the flats and see if I get any kind of vignetting because of the brightness of the sky with those narrow band filters. Now, not only is this test good for myself to see how close can I get to the moon with my setup and my filters, but also how much can, how much does the moon contribute to the brightness? And we are gonna find out how much that corresponds to a Bortle class. I have not looked any of this up, but I'm just gonna guess that I'm gonna say that a full moon is going to be equal to a Bortle class six maybe seven. Now I normally shoot from a Bortle class two to three area. So when the moon comes out, it really does affect me, uh, my imaging. But if you live in a high polluted area, light pollution area, then hopefully this might be able to help you as well. Um, I strongly recommend that you use uh, mono cameras. Uh, if you do live in a high light pollution area as opposed to one shot color, because you can really use that narrow band filters to filter out a lot of light pollution, way more than just a regular light pollution filter does on a one shot color. At least in my opinion. That's, uh, I, I, that's probably an arguable opinion. All right, so let's get started. So how bright is the full moon and how does it affect me here where I live and my astrophotography? Well, according to Wikipedia, the full moon brightness is equivalent to 25,000 candles per meter squared, um, as seen here as 2.5 MCD M squared. And that is equivalent to a Bortle class six. And what that means is that the number of visible stars that you could see in the night sky is around 500. Now, my normal brightness where I live is just under Bortle class three. That equates to the number of visible stars being around 5,000. 
on a night without a moon or a new moon. So, Bortle class zero brightness is actually the number of visible stars is about 10,000. So you could see already that even though I'm only in a Bortle class three and I consider myself lucky to be this, to, to be imaging under skies this uh, dark, I am still only getting about half of my visible magnitude of stars in the night sky. So I also put Los Angeles Bortle class nine and if you live in Los Angeles and you're an astrophotographer, I really feel for you and I am so sorry. And I was surprised that this number of visible stars is actually still 100. So it's not still completely awful, um, but you would be the equivalent of about five full moons in the sky. So if you can imagine the brightness of five full moons, um, that's the brightness that you would have uh, if you lived in Los Angeles. Real quick, I wanted to go over what my settings are going to be for the Tulip Nebula. And actually, they're going to be very similar to my settings for the Wizard Nebula as well. Um, I'm going to be doing binning uh, 2 and dithering after every frame. My gain is going to be set to Unity with an offset of 24. And I'm going to be taking 10 minute subs. And the reason I'm taking 10 minute subs instead of 5 minute subs, which I would normally take during a full moon, maybe even less than 5 minutes, is because I'm really trying to see uh, the effect, if any, that imaging during a full moon would have on my normal imaging. And normally when I don't have a full moon, I am using 10 minute subs unless it's a very bright target in which case I would I would lower it from there. Uh, I'm going to be taking 12 each of hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur and that's going to give me about seven hours, seven and a half hours of total imaging time. So it's I'm going to be inside of the the twilight so I might not be able to use all of my sulfur um, subs. I might end up losing a couple doing it this way. Now for the Wizard Nebula, I'm actually able to start a little earlier in the evening and I'm going to do 14 total subs each. And we'll see after the first night if I lose some of these last subs. And I'm going to be doing oxygen last because I think that the moon is going to be even further away at that time or at least down lower uh, towards the west than, than at the beginning of the night. So I'm going to try that as well. Um, again, I'm not going to be using flats for integration with the wizard. I am going to be using flats for integration with the Tulip Nebula so that I could see what the difference is and if I get any vignetting. And if I do and it's bad, I'll go ahead and put the flats in, in the Wizard Nebula as well. Here's my Tulip Masters after stacking them. And here's the Hydrogen Alpha. And the Oxygen. And the Sulfur too. The, the Sulfur actually surprised me. Um, I did manage to get a lot of detail in the Tulip Nebula, but I think um, I got a lot of the moonlight. Uh, I got a lot of the sulfur light from the moonlight, and um, the Oxygen 3 seems worse, and uh, the Hydrogen isn't too bad, but I'm never expecting Hydrogen to really be too bad uh, with with the moonlight, but still, it, it, it still looks washed out, and um, after playing around with them as best I could, I came up with this image. And I'm really not impressed, super impressed with this image. Um, I really had to stretch out uh, a lot and I had to bring out a lot of the color and of course it doesn't look too good. Um, the You don't see a whole lot of detail and some of the contrast uh, areas here I, I thought would should be a lot darker and but 
it's not bad. I mean, it's not awful. Um, in order to get this to work correctly as well, um, I had to do some funny things with the stars. And uh, because I really had to push this hard. All right, and here's what the wizard looked like. And again, I did not stack this with flats on purpose to see if I could pick up some of that vignetting um, that I was expecting to get with the with the brightness of the sky and I, I believe the wizard was a lot further away um, but the moon was brighter that night that I the first night that I started taking these subs and on the hydrogen you can see that there's the tiniest bit of vignetting but nothing major um, I, I was a little shocked actually at how little there was. Um, however, on the on the oxygen, you could definitely see some uh, here and in the corners. You could definitely see a vignette. Uh, I'm not sure what happened um, at this area right here and, and why <clears throat> I got this weird diffraction spike on this star, um, but I'll probably have to crop that out anyway. Um, so, I guess it turned out that since the vignetting wasn't so bad, and if I crop this out, um, it probably won't affect it much. And as far as the detail goes, I was pleasantly surprised. I mean, this is a full moon. Um, it, it is a little washed out, as you can see, and uh, there's some strangeness to it, and the stacking um, was a little off from one night to the next night. But overall, it's uh, it's not too bad, and, and w this is what I got out of it after. Um, it there could have probably be a lot more detail if this was done on a night without a full moon, um, but I still think I picked up quite a bit of detail in here. I didn't do an unsharp mask, which I could have done as well. Uh, there was a few other things that I could have done to this image to even bring out more detail that I didn't do. And uh, overall, these were this was kind of a test for me. But in the end, I actually really like the way this Wizard Nebula came out. Um, it wasn't it's not oversaturated in color. Um, it's just a well represented uh, object um, and during a full moon. So I, I guess if I mean, I'm hoping that this helps, especially if you live in a Bortle Class 6 um, zone, which is basically the same as a full moon. You would expect to see images such as this when you're finished um, before you before you process them. And yeah, I, I'm actually kind of pleased. Uh, I don't know how much imaging I will do during the full moon. But I know that I can do it. I mean, here's the proof. I, this image is, is pretty decent. Um, not too bad at all. And uh, overall, I'm happy with the experiment. And uh, I'm glad that you guys stuck with me and checked it out. I hope this was helpful in some way. If so, please smash that like button. And we'll see you in the next video.